at Essence Fest 2018. This is the largest ever. So, how do you get the mass number of people in here to join the NAACP to back its efforts to be involved? But for me, it's less about joining NAACP and more about engaging in this political context. If we, if we give direction as we will at the NAACP, people begin to see the value of the NAACP. This election year is perhaps one of the most important we've seen in many years, so we have to turn out black folks, and black folks need to join organizations to support their issues. And again, look, look, look obviously this targets black women, and which we saw what happened in Alabama. Uh, we see what happened in other elections. And so I, what charge have you given to NAACP to ratchet it up even further? For us, it's a data-driven operation. In the past, African-Americans, we've, we've operated out of emotions. And we go out to vote on presidential, but we don't vote on midterms. This year, the NAACP, we've invested in data, and we're targeting individuals who are infrequent voters so we can move the needles in the areas we need to move the needles. So it's not an emotional reaction, it's an intellectual exercise in democracy. Also, I mean, obviously, if you look around here, I mean, you're gonna see uh, a lot of young sisters. You're gonna see teenagers. You're gonna see women who are homeowners. And so again, what is your message to them? Many who say, I may not even grown up with an association with the NAACP. Well, when you look at Essence, it, it represents black America. Uh, high income, low income, working class, uh, uh, entrepreneurs. And in order for us to continue to progress as a community, we must invest in our democracy. NAACP has been the vehicle to ensure democracy work for everyone. So it is my job to show the relevancy of their engagement and their association with, the, with NAACP as it relates to their reality every day. I've, I've been making a point is that we can't just talk about the need for our organizations. We also have to fund them. And so that's also critical because you got to have money to do what y'all do and frankly not rely on corporate America right. to fund the organization. And so how have you been dealing with that as well? So all black institutions throughout the legacy, we have to reinvent ourselves to show why we are relevant. And we can't say it's our fault, other people's fault for not investing in us. We have to show our value. So during my tenure, I'm increasing the value proposition of the NAACP, just like the Essence Weekend has increased their value and the relevancy of, of why this is an important event. And so when we talk about getting them to understand that, I make the point all the time. People say, oh, NAACP hasn't done this, hasn't done that. Yet when somebody gets in trouble, they call on Jesus and the NAACP. And understand that we have 2,200 units across the country. It's a volunteer-driven operation. So we are only as effective as the volunteers in the local communities who sit around the table at that time. So if you care about your personal, if you care about your community or your child's future, you have to stand up and support the organization that's supporting you. Now, you got your national convention coming up. That's going to be in San Antonio, uh, Texas. Is a huge state when it comes to voter disenfranchisement. Uh, and so that obviously is something that's also important because at the end of the day, it's the folks who are attacking the right to vote. Right. So if you think about the NAACP in Texas, we've been boasted, we've invested more time uh, filing lawsuits as a result of voters, voter suppression in Texas than any other state. So Texas is crucial because it is a sleeping uh, giant in democracy. If more communities of color in Texas vote, we change the game of what democracy looks like across the country. We are 25 years away from America being a majority, a majority of people of color country. Uh, how do, and I've been really focused on this, so how do we get black America to understand that we might have numerical numbers in 2043, but we gotta have power, economic power and political power. So demographic is not destiny. It is about can we govern? Can we govern effectively? We've had 40 years of black political leadership from the time the Stokes took over the city of Cleveland, from the time of Gary, Indiana, and Detroit and Atlanta. We've had some successes, we've had some failures. Now it's time for us to learn from both and begin to implement true governance so that we can be stronger once we are the majority. 
Because otherwise, we would find ourselves in an apartheid-type scenario similar to South Africa pre-release of Mandela. Earlier when you mentioned legacy organizations, uh, that is obviously a huge issue, a battle, if you will, because we have folks who say, well, they don't mean anything. But then I say, yeah, but they still exist. And so you got folks who want to start something new, but the question is, are you going to be around? So we are 109 years old. We only exist because local communities identify us as a relevant vehicle for their political voice. 2,200 communities across the country. We exist in 47 out of 50, 50 states, including Hawaii and Alaska. So the issue of relevancy is something I don't entertain because as long as we have local communities who are willing to put up their resources to make the organization go, we will always be relevant. We had a whole lot of, had a whole lot of people who were saying about Black Lives Matter and others. Uh, they were saying, well, they're more important than they should be. So how do you let folks know who are younger or new groups that they can also work in partnership with NAACP. Social justice is not a competition. It is our job as a legacy organization is to create and maintain a space for young voices to emerge. And if they choose different vehicles other than NAACP, great. We want them to have the ability to add their voices to social justice. And it's our job is to protect that voice, not try to compete with that voice. Uh, let's talk about AXO. I have long maintained that AXO is in many ways under focused, under represented, or some folks know, I just think that that can be bigger. So AXO is probably one of the most underdeveloped access of NAACP. It is an academic Olympic in 32 categories for young people between ninth and 12th grade. We have people competing in robotics and electronics and culinary arts. And so it is incumbent upon the NAACP national under my leadership is to grow that program for more young people to understand the value of it. We have over 20,000 kids across the country participating in AXO with 3,000 competing nationally. That should be 100,000 kids nationally and 50,000. So, you know, we got to grow that. It's an underdeveloped asset of NAACP as adding value for our young people. So, five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, where do you want NAACP to be? So, for me, I have a five year strategy. How do we become a metrically driven organization based on the civic engagement calendar? This year's midterm election, next year's census, presidential, redistricting, back to midterm, and how are we measuring our impact from the local community up, not the top down, because all politics are local. We, the impact that was taking place is from state legislative bodies, school boards. We have to be much more strategic, focused, and ensuring that government uh, is representing our interests, and we're not victims of government, we are owners of government. All right, sounds good. All right. All right. Take some selfies. I'll take selfies. All right, go. All right. All right, come on, baby. Come on. You know my husband's first cousin, Otis Blue, and y'all went to Texas A&M together. Oh, yeah. This is his first cousin. How you doing? Cousin. I want y'all to meet the president of NAACP, Derek oh, Johnson. Remember, National Convention, San Antonio. We're right. working it. Are you working? There you go. Where y'all from? San Antonio. Oh, oh y'all tell her. I'll see you all week. How you doing? How you doing? So you'll be there. Oh, yeah. It's my convention. We're living in a world where trust matters, not just trust in the news and information we receive, but trust in who gives it to us. Media outlets are coming under vicious attack, often by politicians angry about being held accountable. Donald Trump rails on and on about fake news, even though he readily dishes it out and lies on a frequent basis. In addition, we watch and consume cable, broadcast, and digital news and see the appalling lack of diversity and inclusion which easily shows up in the stories we don't hear about, stories we know matter. Personally, it has been tough to watch TV news over the last six months since the cancellation of my daily morning news show. Not because I'm not interested, but because of what isn't being discussed and who isn't being heard and what is happening and how it affects not just those on Main Street, but also on MOK Street. Last week, 
The political world was stunned when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a 28-year-old first-time candidate, beat longtime Democratic incumbent Joe Crowley in the New York congressional primary. Her campaign was ignored by traditional media outlets who just assumed the powerful Crowley would coast to victory. That's simply media laziness and taking the public for granted. We see that all too often. We saw it last year when traditional news outlets rushed to interview black women who hit the ground hard to elect Doug Jones to the U.S. Senate in Alabama. But how many of those same outlets would have interviewed those sisters before the election? They were struggling to have their voices heard and getting their message out to raise money to fund their endeavors on the ground. Now, I talked to them on the Tom Jordan Morning Show and TV One, but here we are today, just a few months out from the midterm elections. And where will Dewana Thompson's and Adriana Sh Sh Shropshire's and Latasha Brown's and Stephanie James and Melanie Campbell's and Rosa Clemente's, where will they go to raise their voices before the election? What about the awesome work being done by many of our civil rights groups like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law? We need to hear from them daily regarding the vital work they are doing to counter the shameful efforts to deny us the right to vote. They're filing critical lawsuits. Unfortunately, they don't get as much media attention. Reverend Dr. William Barber and others are picking up the mantle of Dr. King and the Poor People's Campaign, and mainstream media is essentially ignoring the massive mobilization and direct actions nationwide. Here you have a broad coalition of folks from different races and religions fighting for the people, but mainstream media doesn't care to highlight their concerns as well as the campaign. Now look, I can go on and on, but you get the picture. Over the last six months, so many of you have stopped me in airports, train stations, on the streets, in barbershops, and at numerous events to tell me you missed TV One's News One Now and what we did every morning for four years mattered. I've had millennials, Gen Xers, baby boomers, preachers, teachers, CEOs, entertainers, sports figures, men and women, some in tears, tell me how much they learn each day and how vital it was to start their mornings with news and information for us and by us. That's why I'm proud, excited, and humbled today to announce that on September 4th, I will launch a daily digital show that will give a voice to the voiceless and speak truth to power on the issues of the day. This is Roland Martin Unfiltered. He's got it. Whatever the best, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. Yeah. It's on go, go, roll, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. It's rolling, Martin. Pretty cool, huh? And those voices in that song may sound familiar. That is Terry Ellis and Cindy Heron of In Vogue. That song was produced by Slick, and I'm proud to have their support. Folks, Roland Martin Unfiltered will be a daily show broadcast from Washington, D.C. and will focus on news, politics, culture, entertainment, social justice, sports, education, business, and finance. If it's important to you, we'll cover it. You'll be treated to some of the top minds in education, public policy, and academia discussing the news of the day and why it matters to us. We will also hit the road and broadcast from cities across America, holding town halls and forums to hear what the people, not just the DC pundits, have to say. You will see one-on-one -on -one interviews with authors, artists, and other top names going deep to get at what matters to us. We will also do something different. You won't just see it once a day. We will stream the show live and then restream it several times over a 24 hour period and make it available for video on demand. In addition, we will offer a video and audio podcast of the show. And we are in discussions with several TV stations across the country who want to air it in select markets. But folks, there's more. Roland Barton Unfiltered will also live stream speeches, summits, conferences, and other events to our audience. There are a number of things happening every day across America that mainstream media simply ignores. But because of today's technology, we will be able to bring you these events 
unfiltered. You can also expect to see and participate in these live events across the country, such as our town halls, one-on-one -on -one interviews, as well as pop-up events. My team has done this for the past six months as we have broadcast speeches, lectures, and rallies from all across the country, even major events such as Operations Hope Global Hope Forum, the 50th anniversary commemoration of the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, and weekly demonstrations of the Poor People's Campaign. In July, we will broadcast live from Essence Festival in New Orleans, the NAACP National Convention in San Antonio, as well as the Jeffrey Osborne Celebrity Classic in Connecticut. Folks, this will truly be a digital experience like no other. And the great thing about Roland Martin Unfiltered, everything will be interactive. You will get to comment in real time and share your thoughts and views. And in fact, we will incorporate your videos as you talk about what is happening, the news of the day. Roland Martin Unfiltered, folks, this isn't just about me. It's also about you. This is why we want this to be powered by the people. I want to thank Lee Saunders of the American Federation of State County and Municipal Employees for coming aboard as our first corporate underwriter. Their contribution has been vital to get us to this point today, and we look forward to a great partnership. And I can't wait to also share with you some of the other folks we're talking.